Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another BCTL webinar session. This one is Micro Skills and Foundational Skills mm -hmm. for Sociocultural Competency. Uh, tonight, we are very pleased to have Jane Forward from VCC here with us. She teaches communication courses at VCC and is currently in the health science programs. I was previously in business hairstyling and automotive programs, so quite a diverse background there. Uh, she teaches sociocultural competency to new immigrants, established immigrants, and people raised in Vancouver. Uh, obviously, as from the um, number of people turning out tonight, this is obviously a very popular topic and a very necessary topic. Um, she says this competency allows them to join workplaces which in themselves are new cultures needing people with such expertise. So we're really pleased to have Jane here, um, even with uh, some of the technical problems. We are really thankful that you're here, Jane. And um, I will turn over the slides here to you so that I'll start up the slides here and let you begin. So go ahead. Okay, well, thank you, Nathan. And uh, as Nathan mentioned, some of you might have to um, turn up the volume on your computer because it seems that uh, the volume's a bit uh, low coming over my phone line. But um, actually, at the moment, miraculously, I can see the screens, the slides on the screen, and the title slide there, Sociocultural Competency, is showing up. And I just wanted to start by saying that this phrase, the title of my webinar, Sociocultural Competency, to me is all about behavior. And when we think of spoken language being used, a huge part of that, and I like to throw around numbers like 90%, is behavior, and the rest is the words. And that behavior includes things like attitude, of course eye contact, tone of voice, most importantly, those things, attitude, eye contact, tone of voice, are all included in how a person responds. That's what keeps the conversation going is when people respond and responding at the right time with the right amount of attitude and uh, elements contained in your voice and your body. And all that behavior, including mm, nonverbal actions that you use as you speak. Um, all of that requires uh, confidence in order to be able to do it competently. It requires a knowledge of the social milieu that you are in. So in order to behave appropriately, you have to understand what the, the norms of behavior behavior are in the social milieu that you're in. This could be your workplace, classroom, on the bus, in the library. Um, depending where you are, your behavior of how you communicate changes. So that's the, the social part and, and really the cultural part as well because you behave and communicate differently depending on the country that you're in, the city that you're in, um, if you've been lived on the island, you know that the culture there is very different from a bustling metropolis like Vancouver. Or if you've lived up north, you might have noticed the culture up there is quite different. People who live in a northern community, they behave and communicate differently. And that's because communication and behavior are inseparable. So I'm going to see if I can turn the page all by myself. Oh, Nathan's doing it for me. So um, oh, let me try. Move on myself. So sociocultural competency, and in brackets under there, I have this contrasts to social cultural competencies. And some of you may be familiar with that phrase. Some of you with neither phrase. But I'll talk about those in a minute. So this competency um, and knowledge of behavior. It's kind of a little bit of sociology, a little bit of psychology in all of my courses, ESL courses, non-ESL courses, because of course any course has students in it that speak English as an additional language. I love this part and students are fascinated by this part, the sociology and the psychology of language and the behavior of language. So 
to be competent in a new social, sociocultural environment, you need to be aware of the differences, and that sometimes, but not always, is obvious. So we know that some differences are visible, the way people look at you or don't look at you, one, but sometimes you're not aware of those differences. And that's when problems can arise, when you're not aware and you accidentally, without realizing it, um, infringe the rules of the of the socio the social milieu that you're in, and then people think there's something odd about you, but you have no idea that your behavior is odd because you're just behaving the way you always behave, the way you're used to behaving in your own milieu. Um, and then, so once you're aware of those differences, to accept them takes um, some confidence. Some people, many people, they see someone acting or behaving differently. They don't want to accept that. They put up barriers or blocks to the fact that someone is different, behaving differently than, than they are. So the ability of someone to go into a new social milieu, a, a new workplace or a new culture, and to be able to accommodate yourself to those differences, to actually put on and wear those behaviors, to use those behaviors, it takes a lot of confidence. It feels really odd, really awkward, really uncomfortable. It's like wearing a coat that's too small. Sometimes I prepare it to wearing, compare it to wearing shoes that are too small. When you go home from the workplace or from society and you go to your home where your family and your normal communicative behaviors are, then you can go back to your usual communication and behavioral style. You can take off those shoes. But to be able to behave that way appropriately, the way that new and different um, environment behaves, um, uh, takes skill. It takes the ability to be able to perception check. So I said something, and someone's looking at me in a, in a way that's kind of disapproving. And I perception check to myself. Is it, you have, perception checking is, what could it be? What could be going on here? Is it me? Is it them? Um, can I perception check by asking a question? Some people don't. They'll get that um, look of disapproval, and the first thought that pops in their mind is, um, they're a snob. They don't like me. They're being, um, uh, they're, they're looking down on me. And they'll take that negative perception and hold on to it instead of being more open-minded. So all of this requires confidence in oneself um, and a, quite a bit of awareness of the new, um, uh, the new culture. So to be able to um, be competent in these areas of awareness and acceptance um, is sociocultural competency. Then I'd like to contrast that to the discrete sociocultural competencies. And there's a little list of them here. It's not an exhaustive list. The first one is in big, bold letters, active listening, because it's the foundational one. This is the skill that is used the most in any communication by the person who is not holding the microphone and doing the speaking, but the one who is listening. And actively listening requires responding, in other words, speaking. We'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. Um, so active listening. and. That includes um, skills such as paraphrasing back what you hear, summarizing back what you hear, commenting on what you hear, predicting on what might happen next, um, listening to someone and responding in a way that shows that you understand. Active listening is foundational because you use it 
when you go up to somebody to clarify information. You need to respond once the person um, starts to respond to you. When you request information, when you receive feedback or give feedback or request feedback or refuse a request, these are the, um, the skills that make you the discrete competencies that if you can use them in communication, will make you socially, culturally competent. Um, so, uh, let's see. And I'm thinking, uh, wanting to add that these skills, what makes them difficult for someone who is not used to using them is not knowing when to use them or how to use them. And they may want to clarify information from someone or receive feedback from someone in the way that they are used to, in the way that they're comfortable using, the behaviors that are comfortable to them or traditional to them. And to use these is difficult. It's challenging. Okay, so the foundational one, sociocultural competency of the, of the six or seven or even eight that there are, um, is responding with active listening. And it's nice to compare um, active listening with passive listening. So this is kind of, as instructors, what we're very used to seeing. Uh, speak, and the listener nods, a lot of nodding, eye contact, smiling, kind of trying to show comprehension, and maybe indeed there is comprehension, but there isn't a guarantee in the, in the speaker's mind that that listener is comprehending. And as instructors, we kind of like to know when we say something to our students that they've understood. So we want that feedback, that response. So the speaker says something, the listener nods and smiles, the speaker might pause expectantly, and the listener responds with, okay, thanks, or just a nod. So what I've observed, and I'm sure all of you have as well, when students come up to you after class to clarify with you, and you respond with a lot of information, occasionally, expectantly pausing, and they are looking at you and nodding and smiling, and you finish, and they say, okay, thanks, and they turn and walk away. And what would be nice would be if, as you were giving all that information, they occasionally somehow manage to pause you, stop you, clarify a little bit, and then when you finish that information, give you a nice little concise summary of that information. And that would tell you that they understood. It would even confirm in their own mind, because of your response to their response, that they've got it, that they're they're, they're on, you're both on the same page. So later, um, when I finish, I've got a couple of um, ideas for activities where you can really encourage this kind of behavior, um, active listening, to um, ensure that comprehension has happened. Um, let's see. So I talked about the passive listening, which is nodding and smiling and keeping eye contact to some extent. There's another, a, a little bit higher up the scale towards true active listening is the use of encouragers. So as someone is speaking, the listener might go, mm hmm oh, wow, oh, I see. And maybe occasionally will echo a word or a phrase like, oh, up north, hmm. The weather, oh, what oh, cherry blossoms. And these, uh, this technique shows interest and keeps the speaker talking. However, again, just like smiling and nodding and keeping eye contact, these can be faked so that 
the person who's speaking believes that there's comprehension going on, and truly there can be, but it's not a, a real demonstration of comprehension. And there's another note here, encouragers, these were that sometimes I call the famous five. Mm-hmm. Wow. Oh, I see. Uh-huh. They contain, they don't really have meaning in their own. They contain the listener's emotion. Most importantly, interest, which is very important for rapport. Another huge component of being socially, culturally competent is the ability to have rapport with the person you're speaking with. Important in the workplace. Um, In addition to interest, it can also hold confusion, um, surprise, all kinds of emotion. So we've got the passive listening. Encouragers are a little more active, but still fairly passive. And then um, the clarifiers. This is the, the phrases, the that really demonstrate comprehension. Um, So uh, being able to pause a conversation in order to insert a concise paraphrase or empathy statement or question. So that pausing a conversation is incredibly challenging. We'll talk about that in a minute or two. So here's some examples of things you'll throw into the conversation as a listener that are a little meatier, a lot meatier than those encouragers. So you wanted him to do it. So you you must have been worried. So when was this? And my favorite. So going back to what you were saying a minute ago about cherry blossoms, uh, they're simply, I can't remember what I heard, overheard now, um, that uh, the petals are starting to fall right now, you said. Example. This one is very uh, powerful tool to have in your toolkit if you are a slow processor, which personally I am. Conversations are racing around by, around me, and I'll hear an interesting bit, and I'm not fast enough to jump in and make my comment. But when there's a pause a bit later, I can go back. That's useful for anyone who needs more processing time. So the most difficult part, as I said a minute ago, is to get the chance to do this. Because many people will wait for the speaker to pause, for there, for there to be a real pause so you can come in and have your turn. But very, very often, there is no pause, or the pause is very tiny, or the pause is different from the listener's cultural norm of what a pause is. Some cultures, pauses are long. In other cultures, they overlap. So how to get in? You'll see the the word so in front of every uh, example on the slide there. And that so, I tell my students, is the most powerful word in the English language. Because that word is what gets you in. Your hand out, and you say so at the same time. And the dot dot means tiny little pause. You're basically waiting for that person to stop. And 90% of the time, they will. Sometimes they don't. And then you just try again. So, and then wait infinitesimally to make sure that they are looking at you expectantly. And then, voila, it's your turn. A golden gift received when you've paused to clarify. Distracted by a question on the side. Um, But I won't be distracted. Golden gift received when you pause to clarify. So when you do, the speaker will normally not just nod at you and keep going. Normally they give you more. They'll give you more information. 
or they'll correct you if you're incorrect. No, no, actually what I meant was that is so valuable, so valuable. Now here's the thing. Some people, it's part of their makeup, part of their their behavior, or not behavior is the wrong word, it's part of them to um, to not like to be corrected, to not like to be wrong. And that's often um, a problem that needs to be overcome with lots of practice in the classroom. A activity where you do approach someone with incorrect information and clarify and say, so am I supposed to do this? and receive the correction and respond to that correction with more active listening. So um, those two uh, pieces, receiving more information, receiving correction, are like gifts when you have come in to clarify. Um, I do see a question asking, how do encouragers give you more information than a nod and a smile. So if the listener nods and smiles at the speaker, the speaker keeps going. They don't perhaps add more information or correct you, or they wouldn't, because you're encouraging them to keep on going with their story. Um, so all of those, encouragers don't give you more information. I think they give you about the same amount of information because they just keep the speaker going. They keep the speaker talking. Hope that answers that question. Okay, continue on. Um, so entering a conversation is difficult. As I mentioned before, when some, especially when some listeners need more processing time, more thinking time, they need to think about what they heard and they can't manage to also come in and clarify. So here are some people who need more processing time. Introverts. An introvert is not necessarily a shy person. Sometimes they are. But um, really the um, psychological definition of an introvert is someone who... Um, thinks more than they speak, <laughs> likes to think, enjoys thinking and pondering, and, and that's a, a part of uh, their makeup is the, that thinking. And so someone who is introverted um, needs more thinking time, processing time, and will use that strategy uh, of finding a time a little bit later to say, going back to what you were saying, about berry blossoms. Children, of course, some elderly, not all certainly, those who are hard of hearing. Anyone who is overwhelmed by a new environment. So our new students, even though they might have a very high level on paper um, and you've heard them speaking uh, beautiful English, because they may be overwhelmed by being new, they need more processing time. A person in a new workplace who is surrounded by new terminology and new people and new, um, those people all have their personalities that are new, very overwhelming. And of course, those for whom English is not their first language. Okay, so here is hand and so, and I love this picture because if, if it weren't for the little circle that um, I drew on that picture, you would just think this, these are two people, this is how your hands move when you are conversing together. We use our hands when we move, uh, when we speak. And uh, the, it's hard to show in a picture, but when you're actually wanting to come in and pause, the conversation so that you can have a turn, you lean forward slightly. Your hand doesn't jerk out, it just kind of almost almost flops out. 
as you lean forward. Maybe you're all doing it right now. You just kind of lean forward, and, and as you do, you let your hand kind of flop forward in a relaxed way. And really what that's doing is catching the speaker's eye. Uh, you might use it differently depending on whether you are sitting or standing or the person is taller than you or shorter than you, um, but that's the basic technique. The hand catches the person's eye, the word so, uh, and that combination will pause the person. And I see a question. There is a sense of hierarchy here that the hand and so allows entry. So that's making me think, um, and I'm glad that question's coming now, because even though explain this in class before we start an activity, I say how you might be shy about trying this technique, you might not have your your paraphrase or your question in your mind fully formed, but nevertheless, put your hand out and, and pause the person. And people feel uh, from childhood they've been told, don't interrupt, don't interrupt. And if they're trying to um, put their hand out to pause a person who is in a position superior position, hierarchy-wise, an instructor, a supervisor, or a um, more skilled employee who has been given the job of teaching you the ropes, it's hugely difficult to overcome that feeling of, how can I possibly interrupt this person? So I have a different word. I say, hand and so is not interruption. I use the word interjection. You're pausing the conversation, you're not stopping it. Your, your paraphrase, your question, your comment must be concise, must be brief. And then you, you lean back again and you wait for that person to continue. So one of the very first activities I do is very comfortable activity that everyone will do in the first day of class is just a get to know you, chat with a partner, chat with people at your table, tell them something interesting about yourself. And I'll stand back at the front of the room and I'll watch. I don't circle around and listen because, of course, everybody stops. I'll stand back and I'll watch. And then I'll stop them after one minute and I'll say, hmm, I see a lot of very polite listening. Lots of smiling and nodding and great eye contact. But I'm not seeing any hands coming out. It takes a lot of encouraging and practice every class until students become comfortable with it. It's, it's, it's behavior. And if it's not part of your behavior, it's very hard to adopt it or adapt it. Um, any good videos that show this hand and so? My, my, is a question I'm just seeing on the side. Um, I've made a lot, and it's actually how I discovered it. I make so many videos of students and all kinds of interactions, little short one-minute videos, that that's when I noticed, and I would freeze and pause, and I noticed, oh, I get it. I see what's happening here, that it's all of you, without a doubt, use it. You just don't know you're using it. And now that you do know, you'll become aware of it and you'll see other people using it. And that's homework that I give students. Say, English speakers, do this. And I want you now to be aware of it. Put your social scientist hat on with the antennae quivering. Watch. Watch and see how people do this. Okay, hand and so. The, so the most valuable word in the English language is so. Hey, so I call this cues for entry. Put out your hand and say so. What have I got here? Okay, so the cues for entry. How do you know? When can you put your hand out if you're not going to wait for that later moment when maybe there's a pause and you can say 
So going back to what you were saying earlier about rebels. So here's what speakers do. They're talking, 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 and you'll notice that they'll glance away, usually up. And so what they're doing is they're they're kind of looking for the next thought. So it's kind of a signal to you that you can just stick your hand out and say, so even if the thought is not quite 100% there, all you know that in your head is you want to ask a question. So you stop them, and then in those few seconds, the question will come to you. And if it doesn't, you can say something like, uh, oh, hmm, I forgot what I was going to say. Well, maybe not. But in, in the class, if you're practicing in the class, definitely you can write that right up on the board. Um, oh, hmm, sorry, I seem to have forgotten what I was. Because in the class, we're practicing. It's okay to stick your hand out and pause somebody and nothing happens. Here's one that's fun to do. Group of three. One person is talking, telling a story that they're comfortable telling. Person number two waits for one of these moments to go, so... But it's person number three who has to come in and make the active listening comment, paraphrase, or question. That really takes real listening. Okay. Another cue that you might be able to come in with your hand and so is something I called verbal punctuation. And the most common one is, and then. So if you listen to anyone telling a story, and I'll see if I can do it ad hoc here, um, they might say something like, okay, so oh, I... I you wouldn't believe this accident that I saw. I was coming to work today, and two cars just crashed into each other. And then, before you knew it, um, another one came and crashed into that one. So there were three in the accident. And then, of course, so, and then is verbal punctuation. If you hear it, even though the person is rambling on and so, and it's okay. Sometimes you can hear the person has changed the topic. They've already started in on the new topic, but it's so new that it's an acceptable place to come in and say, so, what you were just saying now. And then, of course, miracle of miracles, there's a pause, and then it's easy to come in with hand and so. You might not even need the hand just the so, to make sure that the person who has paused stays paused. So I call this a micro skill. In my title, I think I had micro skill. Foundational skill is active listening. And the micro skill is this hand and so. Okay, so I already gave a couple of activities, I think. So I'll finish up by saying um, here's, uh, here's one. So groups of three, um, each listener, each stu every student has three listener cards with so on it. And each student also has two speaker response cards. One says added more info, and the other says corrected. Now we could say add more info, and the other one correct. So the idea is that um, everybody's supposed to use their cards. So here's a great topic for a speaker, something that you are passionate about that you can describe and give examples about. And here's one that always works, that people can go on and on and on about forever, and that's talk about a health or medical problem that either you have had or someone you know has had. Usually people can talk about that very animatedly. So that's the speaker. The speaker now is paying attention to his or her two cards. And the listener is wanting to, at some point in the story, and I usually give them, say, four minutes to tell the story, and they're going to get cut off. The listener needs to come out 
with their hand, pause them. When they do, then they can put down their so I used one. Up one. That's always fun. Okay. Um right, so the speaker speak at your natural pace for about four minutes and the listener uses up their listening cards. Don't wait for a pause. Again, even if I've, this activity might be the third or fourth activity, I stand back and observe and watch. In the, one minute in to the four minutes, I flick the lights or make everybody stop and say, everyone, that was one minute, and I really only saw a couple of people use their hand and so. The speaker, after responding to the listener's clarification or comment, um, show what they did. Did they add more info or did they correct? Okay. And then at the end, when each speaker finishes their story, one of the listeners can use the active listening skill of concise summarizing. And then a debrief would be after all three speakers have finished speaking to discuss the differences of pacing and pausing. Get some feedback on maybe you speak really fast and to slow down a bit would help a listener and to discuss the length of pauses that a person uses. As of course, it's the pauses that um, that, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Dictate pace. However many, the length of your pauses dictates how fast you speak. Your natural, your um, grammatical pauses. And then also they can discuss how easy or difficult did it feel to use hand and so. I like to start each class by asking students, so you had your social scientist hat with your antennae quivering this weekend. What did you observe? What did you notice? Did you see people using hand and so? Are you starting to use hand and so? Because of course it can be used anywhere and everywhere and needs a lot, a lot of practice to become comfortable with it. Um, can be used in any group activity to aid in participation. And here's another technique. So um, you can make a schedule, you know, have the class list. You decide every week, every two weeks, depends how often your students meet. You want each student to approach you to clarify something about either classwork or assignment work. And this interaction can be one minute, maximum maybe two minutes. And so they come up and they say, oh, I just have a question about X and Y. And you start to get going, because teachers like to explain. And they usually get going quite quickly, speak quite quickly when they're going over something like this. And the goal is for the student to hand and sew and to paraphrase at least twice. And then when the instructor finishes and says something like, is that clear? Which is a very dangerous, very dangerous thing for anyone to say who has given instructions, is to say, is that clear? Because everyone will, most people will nod and smile and say yes. And that can be faked. So what you'd really like them to do, when if you do say, is that clear, is to say yes. So what you're saying is, we need to do X and Y. Thank you. And students need a lot of practice at that, and if they practice with you, they'll be able to do it with a supervisor on a new job. Okay. And then this final picture shows two people in conversation, and some people would say the person on the right is speaking and the person on the left is listening. But I say the person on the right is responding with active listening. She's paraphrasing or asking a question or making a comment, doing something that proves to the person on the left 
that she understands. That's my webinar, my very first webinar. Fantastic. Thank you, Jane. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Lots of good information there. Um, and congratulations on your first webinar. <laughs> Thank you. I wish it Thank had, uh, at least I got my, my slides back up and I could kind of <laughs> see. Um, and then the comments appeared. But it's yes, hard and that's, for me that's, because while I'm yeah. talking, of course, my hands are waving around <laughs> and I'm looking out the window and I got a bit distracted. No, that's all. That's all normal. So, um, I, from what I can tell, I think you addressed all of the questions out of there. So, unless others have questions they'd like to answer now, um, you're getting a lot of good job and thank yous <laughs> right now. Nice. But, thank um, you, yeah, um, I am going to be taking questions. So, if you have any questions, uh, we'll just this last minute here. Um, I will see if there's any, and if not, then we can uh, end it there, but I'll just give it a, a, a minute or so here just to see if anybody is inter in, interested in asking some questions. While, I'm, while we're waiting on some questions, just a few announcements. Um, for those who don't know, I'm surprised, surprised, there is a conference coming up, our annual conference is coming up uh, next week. And so if you are interested in that, we also have a symposium uh, with TESOL International that's on the Thursday. This is a unique opportunity that um, we've teamed up with TESOL International to put together the symposium, one day symposium. And if you're interested in that, just go to the BCTL website, bctl.org, and you'll be able to get more information there, um, as well as for the, the annual conference on the Friday and the Saturday. Um, also, if you're interested in uh, the recording of this webinar, if somebody has missed it and you would like to pass it along, we will be posting the video along with Jane's slides on the BCTL blog. So you can go to our new website, bctl.org, and at the top you can click on blog, or you can go to um, blog.bctl.com. But just um, to promo our website, just go to our new website and check it out, bctl.org, and you'll be able to find the blog at the top. So um, yeah, I have, we do have, it looks like it could be a question here, yes. So first off, answer the question for Jamie. Will we be able to access? Yes, we will access it on the blog. Um, so I can answer that one, but I'll just go back here. Yes, slides will be available. Thank you, Julie. Um, so let's see, go back here. So starting off, because there was a lot that was coming up there. Um, first one is about your videos, Jane. Um, so where can they ask? Are you, are you making those available or can people access those videos? Well, um, that's the thing. Uh, I have them all on my on my personal YouTube channel. Right. Okay. They're they're not um, public. Oh, okay. Yes. So um, I think that was what the question maybe, was. So maybe somebody knows a way that I could make them accessible to teal people without making them public. That's tricky. Um, and so what I would suggest instead, just in the technical aspect, is if people, if you're comfortable with this, if people would want to contact you directly. And then you can share it with just individuals, because um, I don't think we can just make a generic BC Teal part uh -huh. to that. Um, and so um, maybe is how could people contact you if they're interested in finding out more about those videos? Okay. Yes. And I guess I should have put my email on the slide or something. But that's all right. We can put it in the chat box right now. So um, either you can type it in the chat box, or I can type it in. Whatever. So. Well, I've, I'm low teching, holding the phone up to my. Okay. Ear. No, I'll I'll type it out. If you read it, I'll okay, type it out. So it's so. J forward. J forward. Yeah. And I I really before it gets lost, I really want to answer Pomponia's question. Yes. What a beautiful name. Because I have a great tip for that. Anyway, Jane, it's J forward yeah. at vcc.ca. Perfect. I'll put and, that there so people can find it. Yeah, so, yeah, Pomponia's question, any tips for asking a group of students whether they have understood something? So I am, this is great, I, I, I believe. So let's say um, you're talking away and uh, you lose track of the fact that maybe you've been talking a bit too long, and you pause and maybe ask, do that teacher thing. You ask a question of the class, and you know what happens. You ask a question of the class, and the same two or three extroverts uh, shout out the answer. So 
I find myself, I ask the question, and there's a pregnant pause, because I've been talking too long, and I'll say, turn to the person beside you and answer that question. And then they turn to each other, and there's this lovely buzz of conversation as they, as they do that. There's a phrase um, in, um, in healthcare where maybe a nurse has been telling a patient something they need to do at home, and the nurse might say, I just want to be sure that my instructions have been clear. So can you tell me, what, tell me now what it is that you'll do when you go home? So I use this in class all the time, especially after I've given instructions. I'll say, hmm. I just want to be sure that my instructions have been clear. Now turn to a partner and tell your partner. Decide who's A and who's B. And then A, tell B. So I I think that's a good way of um, getting the students in their little group or with a partner, um, because you can say that to a little group, to uh, basically paraphrase or summarize back to each other. That's my answer to that question. Great. I have a couple more questions here. Uh, Julie asked, do you have any resources to recommend watching or reading? Was that reading resources? So, uh, so in other words, are there any books or any videos or anything like that that, that uh, you would recommend? Well, here's the thing. The, the, um, all of this I've kind of discovered uh, and as far as I know, there isn't a book. Um, Tanya has kindly said that I should make a book. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure somewhere there must be. I'm not the first person to have made these observations. But, um, but no, there isn't a book. OK. Um, maybe if anybody has any ideas or anything, they can always share those, and we can post those on the blog post. Um, yeah. Tanya has a question. Do students always buy in, or do they see how great the hand and so is right away? Uh, they do buy in. Um, they're, they're, but they are so innately, from childhood inoculated, if that's the right word, I don't think it is, to not interrupt, that it's very difficult for them. It takes a lot, a lot of practice. I believe they buy in, but they it's just so so hard, so hard to do. Um, now, I'm going back to the book. There is um, a kind of like a little um, homemade book that um, I was able to adapt from uh, materials from VCC because I got the copyright position from permission from our librarian. Um, so that I could share with people who are interested mail it to you about 50 pages long that's great absolutely i noticed beth made a comment about the book from uh, susan kane quiet the power of introversion um and she has an excellent ted talks video as well too that's i've read that book as well excellent book for those who are um not an introvert like myself i'm not and so <laughs> understanding understanding that the perspective and it's, it's very powerful so yeah yeah thank you for sharing that beth important for those students who are extroverts or have an extroverted style of communication whose pauses are um, non-existent is it's it's really polite to um, and kind to just bite your tongue and let someone else come in well said um... I don't see any other questions and no, no other comments here other than there's a lot of thank yous and and uh, obviously been something that people are really excited about hearing about. So thank you very much, Jane. Thank you. And, thank you, everybody. Um, and I've also, again, for those who've missed it, uh, her email is there in the chat box, jforward at vcc.ca. And we will be posting all of the slides and video in the coming days on the BCTL blog. Again, just go to bctl.org and click on blog at the top, and you'll be directed to the blog. So thank you again, Jane, and thank you for putting up with all that, you know, trying to find the best way in here, but I think it worked really well. You got it 
done. And so kudos to you for that. So thank you, thank you everybody for coming. And uh, I wish you all a pleasant evening.